just a um, service announcement uh, for all the speakers. If you are manly and have a beard of historic Baptist proportions, you have to put this mic a little lower. I ruined the audio in the first one by getting it up, up, up in my beard. So I don't guess any of you other guys have to worry about that unless Tom Ross takes, takes off the preaching or something. So that's just a service announcement. Let's, let's start this session out by giving you a little mental exercise. And uh, this isn't a, this is just like one of those uh, brain teaser kind of things. So, Brother Tom here is um, the oldest speaker, and I'm the youngest. Yes, yeah, so you just wrap your mind around. <laughs> this is what ministry will do to you. <laughs> All right, so how many pastors do we have here that do not work any other kind of job besides pastor in the church? Just show hands real quick. Seven. Okay. So, um, for the rest of you, the guys that raised their hands, that's the elite. <laughs> All right? They spend three or four days a week on the golf course. <laughs> You know, they sleep in until about 9 or 10 o'clock every morning. So I don't know what their life is like. That's how the other half lives, okay? <laughs> I have just never been full-time in ministry. And uh, I've always worked 40 to 50 hours a week. Uh, I have seven children, six of them that are still at home. The oldest at home is about to be 18. The youngest is about to be three. Uh, we homeschool our kids, and uh, I have been pastoring there in Charleston now for, I don't know, over eight years, um, and so on. So, in other words, all I'm saying is is that I'm, I'm one of you. And I guess that's why they gave this to me, because these other guys, they can't relate <laughs> to what it is that you're facing and going through. So... I'm going to also start this session now. This is, uh, so they talked about, you know, we're starting late, it's time management, ha ha. And I want you to look at what they gave me that's supposed to be talked about for 45 minutes. I could talk about reading all day, and they gave me, they gave me all this. So anyway, we're going to try to do it. I'm going to start this session, though, with something you're not expecting, and that's honesty room full of preachers, that's the last thing anybody expects is going to be some honesty. Um, I was discouraged a while back. And, uh, of course, that's Charles Spurgeon. And uh, I know I look a lot like him. But uh, I, was dis I was just discouraged. And uh, I turned to Spurgeon. Spurgeon has been, uh, in a lot of ways, I almost consider Spurgeon, it's like meatloaf, you know, it's comfort food. You turn to Spurgeon, and uh, no matter where you turn to Spurgeon, you're going to get something about Christ, yeah, you know. And it's just, uh, it's just encouraging and refreshing a lot of times. So, um, just to tell you a little bit about about Spurgeon and me, about a year before I was called to preach, I had begun to read Spurgeon's sermons and uh, and loved them. I mean, it was just devouring his sermons and reading. Uh, and also come to other articles that he had written in his Sword and Trial, and, and then other some other books that he had written. And began reading those things over the over the over a several year span of time. Just read a lot of Spurgeon. I haven't read all of him, but I've I've read um, you know a pretty good bit uh, of what I could. And Spurgeon's sermons was actually one of the things that God used in my life in calling me to preach. And that's kind of a whole other story, but it's it's almost humorous when I look back on my real early sermons. Um, I can see Spurgeon's influence on my outlines. Now, it wasn't that I was consciously trying to be like Spurgeon, but I can just see that I can see that that influence was there. And I used to I used to preach that way a lot of times, you know. And our first point, you know, and then every time announcing it, you know, Spurgeon always did that. I didn't do that purposely, but I just noticed that I, I'd picked that up. But I hadn't read much Spurgeon in a while, so I went back to him and I thought he's a familiar friend. 
And I anticipated <coughs> being encouraged. Now, for some reason, I guess in the providence of God, I ended up, instead of reading something Spurgeon wrote, I ended up reading some things about Spurgeon's life and many of the things that Spurgeon accomplished in his life. And I'll be honest with you, if there wasn't so many good witnesses to it, I just wouldn't believe it. Right. I don't know how much you've looked at his life. Here's just some of the things that Spurgeon did or some stats about his life. He started preaching at 17 years old. By the time he turned 20, in less than three years, he preached over 600 times. That's a lot. Spurgeon preached for 38 years. He died at the age of 57. It seems like he lived to be 157, everything that he did. Spurgeon, um, for much of his ministry, had his weekly sermons published, and you can read about that process, how that, how that all came together. They were published in 20 different languages and sold 20,000 copies a week for most of his ministry. His collected and published sermons fill 63 volumes, which is still today the largest collection of books of by a single author. I don't believe it's ever been equaled. And just a couple of months ago, uh, they put together a two-volume set of previously unpublished sermons. So now you're up to 65. He wrote over 140 books besides that 63 volume plus two of sermons. He pastored a congregation of 4,000 members. He edited a monthly magazine. He read around six books a week, and these were not dime novels. He, he read books of weighty Puritan theology and typically could read six of them in a week. He founded and oversaw, I mean, he had a hand in over 60 different organizations during his life in ministry. He had a pastor's college. Regularly counseled what he called difficult cases. You know, in other words, when all the other pastors were stumped and they didn't know what to do or, or you know, where to turn, they'd send them to go see Spurgeon. So he dealt with all the hard cases. He had a wife that was nearly invalid and twin sons. He also lived with constant physical pain. He really suffered. Had uh, rheumatoid uh, gout and, and, and various things. Suffered through horrendous bouts of depression. Um, if you read about that, constantly facing criticism and slander. They were writing about Spurgeon and his Sunday sermon in the Monday morning paper. Criticizing him, ridiculing him drawing, you know, um, character sketches. Maybe you've seen one, one famous cartoon of that ape that's lecturing to those other apes and, he, and he's got a, 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 just the head of Spurgeon sitting there on the table making fun of the, the lectures that Spurgeon had given. But anyway, he, that was the kind of thing that he dealt with. And that's not even everything that he did. And he did all that without a MacBook and without an iPhone and without the Internet without any sort of digital tools. Like I said, it's, if there was just not so much valid witness, I'd have a hard time believing how did one man accomplish that much? Well, I guarantee you one thing, he made good use of his time. I don't know how he did it. I can't tell you how to do it. I don't know. So you say, well, how is this encouraging? <laughs> Well, that's about the way I was feeling too. Yeah, this isn't really encouraging. It's lifting me up too much. But it is encouraging if you think about it because it can relieve a burden. All right? Your grandmother thinks that you're better than Spurgeon, but you're not. And I'm not either. And none of us are. Nobody ever is or is going to be. I have no idea what God was doing when he put Spurgeon on the earth. I have no idea. But that was, that was what God did, and I think he did it once. It's just, that's just how it is to it. So what I'm saying is, it can relieve a burden that we don't, don't, don't try to be Spurgeon. Don't try to, don't try to be Charles Spurgeon, but, but more than that, don't try to be any other preacher either. I, I realize we all have kind of heroes. We have guys that we really look up to. 
And there's probably each of us we could go around and we could say, if you could really be like one preacher, what would it be? And you, you might have somebody that you would think of. I'd, I'd really, I'd love to be able to preach like him. If I could do that. Oh, I'd love to be able to do that. You can't do that. And God, more importantly, has not called you to do that. Amen. He's not called you to be Spurgeon. He's not called you to be you know, some other great preacher of the past, nor some great preacher today. That's not what God's called you to be. So Spurgeon, um, to his college students, and this is kind of a long quote, um, and I'll just read a little bit of it. He says, um, Gentlemen, I return to my rule. Use your own natural voices. Do not be monkeys, but men. Not parrots, but men of originality in all things. In other words, Spurgeon says, be yourself. Be, your, be authentically yourself in your life and ministry. Um, he goes on, let's see. Um, I would repeat this rule till I wearied you. If I thought you'd forget it, be natural, be natural, be natural evermore. An affectation of voice or imitation of the manner of Dr. Silvertongue, the eminent divine, or even of a well-beloved tutor or president will inevitably ruin you. I charge you, throw away the servility of imitation and rise to the manliness of originality. Spurgeon told his young pastors, be yourself. You be what God has made you and what God has given you. Don't try to be Spurgeon. Don't try to be Martin Lloyd-Jones or, or whoever else or, or John Broadus or B.H. Carroll or, or whoever else it is that, that, you, that you look up to. It's fine to have models and to learn from people. And I've learned from Spurgeon and I've learned from others and I hope I'll continue to learn. I've learned from men in this room. But be yourself. And you say, well, that's, that's good advice from Spurgeon, but we're worried about the Word. Well, Paul told Timothy the same thing. If you look at these verses, 1 Timothy 4, 14, 2 Timothy 1, 6, 1 Timothy 4, 16, neglect not the gift that's in thee. It's in you. Timothy, you neglect not what's in you. Stir up the gift of God that's in you, he says. Take heed unto yourself. That's exactly what he was telling Timothy. You need to, you need to be who God has made you and gifted you to be. I'm going to tell you right now, you cannot preach like Tom Ross. I can't preach like Tom Ross. Sometimes Tom Ross can't even preach like Tom Ross. <laughs> you have got to be who God has made you to be. And just as a, as a quick tip, one of the best ways to be completely authentic in your preaching is that you take this word... You study this word, you work through it, and you come to understand it. And then when you get up and you explain it the way that you understand it, you will be authentically yourself to your people. Amen. So each preacher is responsible for God, before God, for the gifts that he's been given. In other words, the faithfulness and the stewardship that's required of us is going to be according to what we have received. You remember the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. You know, he gives one talent to one, two to another, and five to another. And when he comes back and he begins to reckon, he didn't hold the guy that had received one talent to the same output of the guy that had received five, but he held him to the same faithfulness. In other words, the guy that had received five had to be faithful with the five that he was given. Just as the guy that had received one had to be faithful with the one he was given. That was what was expected. That was the account that had to be made. So, let's just face it. Spurgeon, a five-talent preacher. Most of all the rest of us, one-talent preachers. That's it. So, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verses 6 and 7. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. 
So Paul's words to Timothy gives us two keys to being a good minister of Jesus Christ. And I certainly hope that if you're preaching and you've been called to preach, I certainly hope your goal is to be a good one. Right. To be a good minister, a good servant of Jesus Christ. A good preacher of His Word. He gives us two keys. First of all, he says in verse 6, that a good minister of Jesus Christ is nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine. Being nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine. And verse 7, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. There's two things he says there about being a good minister of Jesus Christ. Being nourished up in the word and good doctrine and exercising yourself um, unto godliness. So, to be well nourished, we have to regularly take in proper food. That's just the way that it is. Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. You know, if you're going to drink uh, Mountain Dew and eat little Debbie Christmas cakes all the time and then wonder why your blood pressure and your, and your cholesterol and everything, I'm just jabbing at Lewis there. <laughs> garbage in, garbage out, guys. I mean, if, if we spend our time just, you know, taking in nothing but garbage to our bodies, we got a bill that's going to be coming due. It's going to take a toll on us over time. Well, it's, it's really no different in the nourishment of our souls. And as a preacher of the Word of God, you have to have a well-nourished soul. You see, it's kind of like a bank account. Because you can make withdrawals, but pretty soon, if you're not making enough deposits to cover the withdrawals, you begin to bounce checks and you go bankrupt. Same way with our souls. As you are ministering, whether it's, whether it's written word, whether it's preaching, whether it's teaching, whether it's counseling, whatever it is, you're withdrawing. You're withdrawing from that account. You are taking money out. And if you're not regularly putting money in, it's not going to be too long before you are bone dry. And you're going to be like the, the, the Sunday morning woes or whatever it was that was talked about or Saturday woes or whatever it was. You're going to, you, I got nothing. I'm supposed to preach tomorrow. I don't, have, I don't have anything to say. So you've got to be nourished up. What does that mean? That means you've got to be regularly reading the Word of God. And that's in, that's in addition to... I'm not talking about reading the Word of God for sermon prep. I'm saying you've got to be reading the Word of God regularly to feed and to nourish your soul. Amen. There's really no, no shortcuts for this. You realize it takes the whole Bible, and I know that's a big book, but it takes about, at a normal reading speed, it takes about 70 hours to read the whole Bible. So if you break that down... In 10 to 15 minutes a day, you can read the entire Bible in a year. Entire Bible in a year. So, what if you did that this year? What if you did that this year? What if you read the whole Bible this year? And then what about if you did it next year too? And the year after that? And the year after that? And the year after that? What kind of difference do you think that that might make in your life? And I mean in your own soul much less for your preaching. It, it will profit your preaching, but what kind of difference do you think that that would make if you did that every year for 5, 10, 15 years? It's, it, it's incalculable. Yeah. So, I do recommend reading through the Bible in a year or two years, whatever. But read through the Bible. Read the Bible every day. Read it and, and, and mm -hmm. meditate in it. And I do recommend using a reading plan. And I know a lot of people don't like that. They don't like to use a reading plan. And I'll just be honest with you. I set out many times to read the whole Bible. I'm going to read this thing. And Leviticus comes. <laughs> and then I finally, finally mustered up the courage to get through Leviticus. And I hit first and second Chronicles. If you make it through Leviticus, 1st and 2nd Chronicles will kill you every time. <laughs> I never read the whole Bible one time except when I have used a plan and committed to doing it daily. I just haven't, I just haven't been able to do it. Maybe you're, maybe you're better than me. 
Maybe you're, and I, I mean, I'm not saying I'm the standard. I'm just saying maybe, maybe you have more gumption about you to be able to do that than I do. I don't know. I, all I know is I can't. If I don't have a plan and I'm not committed to it, I'm not going to get it done. It just don't, it just don't happen. So I do recommend reading through the Bible, reading with a plan. You also, you need to read other books. Um, you, the, the preacher is a, is a person that you have to know a little bit about everything. I don't know how to put it any other way. It's one of the, the famous uh, uh, things that uh, George Herbert and his uh, country parson talked about. You, you've you've got to know a little bit about everything as a, as a preacher. And you don't have enough time to learn it all. You don't have enough time to experience it all. But you're going to be talking to a group of people that have all kinds of different experiences and backgrounds and areas of knowledge in life. You need to be able to relate to them. Because not only do you need to know the Word to be a good preacher, you've also got to know people. Yeah. And you've got to know the world. You've got to be able to, uh, to, to look at and to understand and see things that's going on. You've got to have some understanding of, of what it means to be working full time and facing the, the pressures of project managers and bosses and, and, and working to a clock and working to deadlines. And you need to understand those kind of things. So, so some of it will be from your experience but you also need to read. You also need to read because you need to be challenged. Now, we've been giving away a bunch of books. And I guarantee you there's probably something in every one of them. Well, except we have given some Bibles, so I better qualify that. But aside from the Bibles we've given away, there's something in every one of those books that you don't agree with. Well, let's face it, you don't agree with everything in that Bible either. But, but So, you know, you know what I'm saying. You've got to learn how to be challenged, especially as a preacher. You've got to learn how to be challenged. You've got to learn how to be able to sift through and gain that discernment. And I'll be honest with you, you'll, it'll, it, it's, a, it's a long road. You know, there's, there's times I've read something that I thought was great. A few years later, I realized that was garbage. But at the time, I thought it was great. Boy, it made perfect sense. It was wonderful. A few years later, I would recommend that book to my dog, and he can't read. <laughs> so, you need to be challenged. You need to be reading other things. You need to be reading things that challenge you. You, you don't want to spend all of your time in an echo chamber where you're just constantly affirmed in things you already know and already believe. I had a conversation with a preacher one time, and he was asking me something about some subject, and I, 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 I didn't have a whole lot to say about it, but I said, I do remember reading this book, such and such, and he talks about that. He did a really good job with it, and I, I said, I, I think maybe that would help you in, in looking at it, and so he started asking me a few questions, and he said, well, you know, who, who is that author? Tell me about him, you know. Is, is he a Baptist? Is he this? Is he that? Is he, is he the other thing? And uh, I said, uh, you know, some of that I, did, I just honestly didn't know. Um, I had come across the book one way or another, and I'd read it. Uh, I didn't really know all that about him, and he finally went on to say to me, he said, well, he said, I don't really like to read things that I don't agree with because I'm afraid it will change my mind. <laughs> we'll just leave that right there. <laughs> Matthew chapter 13, verse 52. Jesus said that when the scribe is instructed under the kingdom, he's able to bring forth out of the treasury, out of the storehouse, things that are old and things that are new. And if you're not continually reading and challenging yourself and, and, and pressing yourself to go forward, you know what's going to happen? Your preaching is going to be stale. Right. That's right. There will be no freshness to your preaching whatsoever because you're just not growing. You're stagnant. Your, your mind is, is not being challenged and exercised. Um, it's much like the rest of your body. It's going to be flabby. You need a knowledge, as a preacher of the Word of God, you need a knowledge of the whole Bible. You know, that uh, seminar was presented this morning about all the different genres. You've you got to know that stuff. You've got to have a knowledge of the whole Bible. Just because you can work up a pretty good sermon on Romans 8, 28, doesn't mean you know the whole Bible. You've got to know the whole Bible. And there's just no shortcut for that. There's, somebody asked me one time, how do you read a book? And I said, well... Now, I've been making a lot of cracks at these guys about places where they're from, and I'm from West Virginia. So, but I said, I'm, I'm just kind of a, of a hillbilly, 
I said, the only way I know how to read a book is you take it, you open it up, you start with page one, and then you read all the way to the end, and then you close it. <laughs> I don't know how else to read a book. If there's, I'm, I'm sure somebody's figured out another way, but I, we ain't heard about that up in the hills, so I don't know. <laughs> you, you need a knowledge of the whole Bible. There's no way to get it except by reading and studying the whole Bible. There's just, there's just no shortcuts for that. There's no life hack for that. You better know the whole Bible yourself. And the more you know the Bible yourself, the less dependent that you are on other men who do. Right. That's right. You're, you're going to be a slave to other men if you don't know the whole Bible. If you're not reading and studying it for yourself, you're going to always be a slave. Now, don't get me wrong. We're always dependent on others. And we're always going to be taught. We're going to hear, we're going to hear preaching and whatever, and we're going to be... We're going to be taught. We're going to read, and we're going to learn. I mean, that's just that's just how it goes. But you're you're going to be a complete slave to other men if you don't read and know the Bible for yourself. To exercise yourself, this was the second key to exercise yourself, and this is the place where we lose people because you know what that word means to exercise yourself. It means discipline yourself. Train yourself. I get a lot of pushback at times from guys, and just it seems like to me people just don't like that term, discipline. It sounds unspiritual, I guess, for some reason. Oh, I can't read the Bible by plan. That's, that's structured. That's just, I would be doing it out of obligation because I'd have to do it. Well, I used the illustration one time. I said, is it better off for you to, on your phone, set your reminder a few days in advance of when your wife's birthday is, and so every year you remember it and celebrate it appropriately? Or is it better for you that when you just happen to remember it and celebrate it appropriately? Now, just tell me which one of those two scenarios is going to work out better for you. There's nothing wrong with a plan, guys. It's wisdom. It's prudence. It's understanding ourself. But just like I said, I learned I can't read the whole Bible if I don't commit to a plan. I'm just not going to do it. I, I'm going to get off track. Whatever's going to happen, I'm just not going to get it done. Paul's example, and you can correct this on your slide, at 1 Timothy 4, that's the wrong reference. This is 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27. And you notice what he says there. Um, Every man that's striving for the mastery is temperate in all things. And Paul goes on to say, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. You know what temperance means? Temperance means self-control. You have to control yourself. That's what discipline is. That's what training is. You have to control yourself. You have to discipline yourself. You also have to be good if you look at 1 Timothy 4, 7. He said, refuse profane and old wives' fables. Another way that we could take that would be don't waste time. Don't waste time. He says, exercise yourself rather unto godliness. Don't be wasting time on things over here that's just trivial and silly. Things that's just foolishness. Don't be wasting time on that. Don't be wasting time on things that are gender and strife and is not the edification. <coughs> Don't be wasting time with that exercise. Train yourself to godliness. Discipline yourselves to godliness. So if we are to summarize the qualifications of a pastor, and I do mean, I, I mean categorize them. I don't mean, I'm not saying if we reduce these to the minimum. It's not reducing it to the minimum. It, it's saying if we take the qualifications of a pastor through the pastoral epistles, put it in three general categories, this is what we get. A pastor must be a godly man. He must be a godly man. He must have godly character. He must be a man of integrity. He must be a man that can be an example to others. He must be a godly man. Number two, he must know the Bible. And number three, he must be able to teach it. So if we take the pastoral qualifications and we just take them to those three broad categories, you've got to be a godly man, you've got to know the Bible, and you must be able to teach it in order to be a pastor. 
I don't know how that you're going to do that aside from disciplining and training yourself to be in this Word and to gain mastery and self-control over your life. I don't know how else you're going to do it. So we're going to end this with some practical suggestions. Number one, and if I have any sort of a secret, this is it. And I don't, I don't believe I do, but I'm just saying if there is any sort of secret, I believe this is it. You need to be a plotter. You need to learn to make the most of the time that you do have. I don't have 20 hours a week to study for one sermon. I just don't have it. I'd love to. Don't get me wrong. I'd love to. I just don't have it. Some of you uh, guys, you know, you get your study in on the golf course. I realize that. But for the rest of us, we're working all these. We've got, we got all these responses. I mean, I'm just saying, you don't have 20 hours a week to study for one sermon. You're preaching. I preach three times a week. You don't have 20 hours to put into it. So you have to, to be a plotter. And this is something that just like if you're going to learn a musical instrument or if you're going to learn a foreign language, it's been proven, even scientifically, that spending shorter times of practice but doing it regularly, consistently, day after day after day, will yield better results than every so often spending marathon sessions of practicing. So you just practice every so often for hours and hours and hours, um, and you do that maybe three or four times a year, and then you take someone who practices maybe 15 to 30 minutes a day on their instrument, but they do it every single day for a year, which one of them is going to be better at it at the end of that year? And again, that's even been, been proven scientifically that that's the way that it is. So you've got to learn to make the most of the time that you have. And so always have, always have a book with you. I, I mean, always have a book with you. I've got a phone. I've got hundreds of book, books on this phone. And I can, I can read. I can spend five minutes reading here, there, whatever. In the old days, when I first started preaching, you know, that's in prehistoric times, there was no such thing as a smartphone. And I had to carry around a book, or sometimes two or three books, but I kept one with me all the time. And just, you know, just whenever you need a break, you've got some downtime, you know, your mother-in-law is talking, whatever, you open up the book, and you, and, you know, right there, you read. That's just how you do it. I, I'm just being serious. Um, keep a book with you. Uh, I read uh, the first year I was preaching, a preacher loaned me Preachers and Preaching by Martin Lloyd-Jones. And I read that book, and I don't remember none of it. But one thing that Lloyd-Jones said there that, that stuck with me was he said, always have a notebook with you or a pad or paper to be able to write down thoughts and things that come to you, to be able to capture them when you have them. And I've, I've practiced that. So you've got... Keep a, keep a notebook with you, or again, you can do it on your phone. You can do voice memos, whatever, whatever that it is. You like the sound of your own voice, you can do voice memos, whatever. We have tools, so you've got something with you all the time. And when you've, when you've got a break, instead of looking at that People magazine in the doctor's office for 15 minutes, read a book. Amen. Read the Bible. You know, read, read something that's going to be profitable. So you have to... Learn to make the, the, the most use of your time. There was a track, and I ain't been able to find it, but it's out there somewhere, uh, an old, old Puritan track to how to learn the value of, the, of a quarter of an hour. Do you realize how valuable the 15 minutes can be? What you can actually do in 15 minutes. It doesn't seem like much time. It's easier to get out there and play Angry Birds or something on your phone in 15 minutes or spend 15 minutes on Facebook that turns into five hours. It's easier to do that than it is to read for 15 minutes. But if you will make the most use of the time that you have, if you will plod, you'll be more productive over the long time. And, and this is something that was really helpful to me. Um, and I read a book, I think it's called How to Do What You Want to Do. I think the guy's name was Paul Hawk or something like that. Um, and, and one of the, the best ideas I took away from that book, that guy was a psychologist and, and whatever, but anyway, you've got to forget the idea 
of a perfect world. And what I mean by a perfect world is there was a lot of times I had all these ideas of things that I needed to do or wanted to do, whatever, that would be good to do, but I knew that I couldn't sit down and do that from start to finish, and so I would never start. I knew I couldn't do the whole thing, so I didn't do, I did nothing. Forget about that. Do a little bit when you can. Do a little bit when you can. I've been writing commentary on Proverbs for two years. I'm in almost to the end of chapter 19. I just, I, I said, you know what? I, I, for years, I'd been going to do this. I said, I'm just going to do it. I made, a, I made my own, just my own sort of personal commitment. I said, I, I want to write one verse. I'm going to take one verse. I'm going to write that, and I'm going to do that every day, every Monday through Friday. So five times a week, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to, and I'm going to put it online so everybody can see it. Say, I don't got to keep me accountable. Well, two years something later, still going, still going. I'm not a, I'm not a slave to it. There's times I, I can't, uh, can't get it done, and I don't rush just to get something out because I want to. But I'm, but I'm just saying, I quit with the idea of I want to be able to sit down and spread all these books out and, and just to do all this in one whack. It's just never going to happen. But if you do a little bit at a time, and a little bit at a time, you'd be surprised what you can get done. Don't neglect your family. Amen. Ministry life is a constant struggle for balance. And I guarantee you, no one gets it right all the time. It's a constant struggle. Not only is it a constant struggle, but you're getting older. <clears throat> Your kids, if you've got young kids, they grow up. They get older. You know what happens? Things change. Circumstances change. The things that they need changes. Life's always changing around you and you're having to adjust to it. But do not neglect your family. That is your first ministry. Amen. And it's your first priority. It's your first responsibility. And honestly, if we're just going, let's just be honest about it. If a man is neglecting his family to preach the Word of God, he's not fit to preach the Word of God. Amen. He needs to step down. He's not fit to do it. So never put that ministry ahead of your family. Just, you, you can't neglect them. One of the things I started doing a while back is I say Saturday is my family's day. I give it to them. Now, there are times when something comes up and I have to do something or, or whatever, but otherwise I say I'm at my family's disposal. Whatever they want me to do, Whatever they need to do, I'm at their disposal on Saturday. And that's just the way I've done it for the last few years. And I don't plan on changing anytime soon. That's their day. If it means going to the grocery store, and we load up, we go to the grocery store. Whatever. I, it's, it's, it's their day and their time. So, now I'm not saying you have to do that. But I'm just saying, don't, don't neglect them. Don't neglect them. Realize you do have a responsibility there. Um, next, I would say, understand who you are. Understand who God has made you to be. Understand what gifts and things that God has given you. And again, don't, don't try to be somebody else. Don't, don't try to preach like uh, this other brother. And, and, and another thing, don't try to live up to their expectations. Do you realize that the Bible says that every servant stands or falls before who? His own master. Who's the master? Well, it's not Dr. Dearly Beloved that has been ruling the brethren for the last 30 years. The master is Christ. That's who you're going to give an account for. And when you stand before Christ to give an account, you're not going to give an account for me. And I'm not going to give an account for you. I'm going to give an account for myself. I'm going to give an account for my family, and I'm going to give an account for the people that God put me over. That's who I'm going to give an account for. So don't, don't, don't become 
slaves to other men and trying to gain the approval of other men. You need to understand who you are, who God has made you to be, and understand what your responsibility is before Him. And here's the next one. And I think somebody tried to delete this, but it's, it stayed in. The diet and exercise. All right, let's just address the elephantitis in the room. Now look, I ain't skinny, all right? And, I, and there's a whole lot of things about fitness that I'm going to be honest with you. It's vainglory, and it is idolatry. Right. There are people that are worshiping the human body. But we are called to be stewards. Some of us are given more to work with than others. But we are called to be stewards of what God has given us. So we do need to discipline ourselves. Brothers, long times of study and the type of things involved in ministry are not good for your health. They're hard on your health. Very hard on your health. So you need, especially as we start getting older, you know, we start having problems and, and, and different things and blood work comes back and it's not looking so good and different things. But you, you need some exercise. Amen. These bodies have to be worked. The muscles that we have have, have got to be worked. And again, I, I'm, not, I'm not telling you to go join Fire Breathers CrossFit training like a bunch of nuts rolling them big tires and stuff. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just saying you need, you need some exercise. You need to move. You need to get the blood flowing and, 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 and you know just work your body. You need, you need to do that in one, whatever way. Some people like jogging or whatever, whatever it is. It don't, it don't matter. Just, just get something to be more active in your life because the ministry tends to make us very sedentary and, and, it, and it tends toward very, uh, being very demanding and stressful on our bodies. So if you're going to be a good preacher and you're going to, to grow over time, and I don't mean a growing waistline, I mean growing in your ability to understand and to preach the Word of God and to pastor people and so on, then you're going to need to be as healthy as you can be. I realize a lot of us have different genetics and, and all of that kind of stuff. And, I, and again, I'm not telling anybody to be skinny. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not, and I don't expect I'll ever will be. I never have been. So, you know, I was the I was the chubby kid in fourth grade that you know could never get my shirt and my pants to meet. You know, it just always kind of always was a struggle all day long. So I'm just telling you, I, I'm not I'm not about that. I'm, but I'm just saying that when it comes to diet, that we do need to be concerned about the things that we're putting into our bodies. Now, when I was 20 years old. I could get up in the middle of the night, drink chocolate milk, eat pizza out of the refrigerator without even warming it up, finish that off with some Cheetos and ice cream, and go to bed and sleep like a baby. <laughs> now, I can't even look at Cheetos without getting heartburn. And pizza, for just forget it. Forget it. If it's after, if it's after 5 o'clock, you just forget pizza. Just mark that off the list. You're going to be up all night long revisiting that. So, I'm just saying, because we do need to spend some time in, in, in this area of, of discipline of our lives as well, <coughs> of learning and, and understanding things that are, that are healthy and, and are good for our bodies. And I'll be honest with you, there's a whole lot of, of diet and exercise that's just a bunch of people trying to sell you stuff. That's right. Yeah. It, 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 it's pretty much, a, it's, pretty, it's a pretty simple thing. It really has to do with moderation. Yeah. Yeah, right. You can eat pretty much anything you want as long as you do so moderately. And, and also, in turn, you know, you're having some activity, you know, some being active. So let's not, let's not overlook this. You know, diet and exercise. Is it the most important thing? No. Should it control your life? No. And if Lewis Kiger loses a bunch of weight, don't put a picture of yourself in your drawers on Facebook. All right, we don't. Nobody wants to see that. All right. All right. Just I have I have two rules, and this is this is the only alliterated outline I have. These are my rules when it comes to presenting ourselves or whatever. 
have modesty or have mercy. <laughs> All right, modesty or mercy. Anyway, let's move on. The next one, personal finance and debt. Debt will cripple your ministry. That's right. You get yourself up over your eyeballs in debt, and it'll cripple your ministry. It'll do great damage to your family as well. I, I'm not trying to say that, but I'm saying you will, you will be crippled in the ministry. Now, we have a responsibility to provide for our family's needs. And, and brothers, that's your responsibility. That's right. I don't care what the church pays you. That's your responsibility that your family is taken care of. It's your responsibility. Now, we do need to be careful with our money. We, 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 you know, we need to, to be careful with debt. And the consumer debt statistics in this country are, are shocking. And if you live like the average American, then you're going to be in bondage. Solomon said that the borrower is a servant to the lender. He said in the book of Ecclesiastes, if you don't owe any man anything, why is he going to take your bed? Why is, he, why is your car going to get repossessed and you can't make it to church? If you don't owe anybody anything, well, that's not going to happen. A lot could be say, said about that, and I, I continue. So, again, guys, when, as you're reading and reading other areas, man, read some things about money. Yeah. Read some things about business. Read, read some things about learning how to handle these things and, and how to manage and, and so on. Here's another one, um, and we got we got to get this done. So, when preaching, it'll save you some time if you don't try to say everything every time you preach. You can't preach Genesis to Revelation every time you preach. I've tried, and I, I ain't been able to accomplish it. But don't 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 say everything. In other words, as as we're preaching, first of all, and people always want to know. How long does it take to prepare a sermon? And really the only correct answer to that is it takes as long as it takes. Yeah, that's, right. that's the only correct answer. Now, the other correct answer is it takes more than 15 minutes. Yes. But beyond that, it takes as long as it takes. And I will guarantee you, no matter how much time you have, you will never have enough time to prepare a sermon. You can always spend more time. I mean, there's just no, there's no end to that. So, it will help you if you will get focused. If you will get focused. And when you're preaching, you realize, and uh, Jason in his seminar was talking about, you know, identifying that big idea. You know, what, what is this sermon about? What is, what is the one thing that I'm really saying to, to God's people in this message? And so the more focused you are, it will help you. And you also have to learn how much is enough. You know, how much is enough to, to cover this adequately. And that will help you with, with time. Um, oh, I thought I had another slide. Well, I do, have, I do have another one. Learn the biblical responsibility of a pastor and strive to fulfill that. It's already been mentioned a few times in this seminar. There's a whole lot of expectations on a pastor that are not in the Bible. And some of them that are just, just to be honest about it, just unbiblical. You need to learn what the expectation of a pastor is from the Scripture and strive to fulfill that. Not, not the, the outline that the pulpit committee come up with, but what the Bible says your job is. That's where you need to learn your job description. In Acts chapter number 6, verses 1 to 7, when the, uh, the, uh, the widows are being neglected, you know, they come complaining about it. Peter and the other apostles, what did they do? They said, you look out and you find you seven men full of wisdom and of the Holy Ghost, and you will appoint them over this business. So in other words, part of managing your time as a pastor means... You've got to learn to delegate responsibilities to other people. You've got, you've got to learn to, to... You can't do everything. And I, I get it. 
I get it. It is easier a lot of times to do it yourself than it is to deal with Grumpy Steve and trying to get him to do it and do it right. It's easier a lot of times just to do it yourself. I understand that. But same thing, same thing with your kids. That's right. A lot of times we get in there and we start folding the laundry. It'll go a whole lot quicker and be a whole lot better done if I do it myself and put it up as opposed to having them do it. But they've got to learn. That's right. They've got to learn. So you, so as a pastor, and, and, and some of you guys, and I'm going to avoid certain parts of the room, some of you guys have just got control issues, man. you got to let that go. I realize that there, we, we would like everything to be exactly the way we would want it to be, but you've got a responsibility. You, you should be bringing people up. They should be maturing under your ministry, which means they, they should be serving. Right. Ephesians 4 says that pastor teachers are given to the church to equip the saints that they might do the work of ministry. So it's our responsibility not to do everything for them, but to encourage them and to lead them and to equip them and to teach them and to show them how to work. So some of you guys, and I, and I myself have been a big offender in this as well, some, sometimes we have such a time management crunch because we're just simply trying to do things we ought not be trying to be doing. Let somebody else that can do it. Uh, Peter said in Acts 6 2, he said, It's not reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. In other words, he recognized we're called to the ministry of the Word of God. And it's it's not it's not reason that we should set that aside and serve tables when other guys can. And in verse 6 4, he says, We'll give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And my parting shot on this, one of the, another big challenge to uh, our time management and to burnout and all that sort of thing is because somewhere around the end of the 19th century and going into the 20th century until today, Baptist churches have forsaken multiple elders in a church. Amen. I'm not telling you to be Presbyterians. That's what everybody wants to hear. Oh, elders. If you look back through our through our Baptist history, Baptist churches had multiple elders in them until around about the end of the 19th century. Amen. Now we've not really known it in our lifetimes. But in history, it has been the case. It's in the New Testament. So sometimes one of the problems is, is that one guy is trying to do what really maybe two or three ought to be doing. That's right. So I'll just give that to you. I think that it is something that we need to really give serious thought to. What is the biblical teaching and pattern for elders in a church? I'm not saying that a church is not really a church if, if they just have a single elder pastor. I'm not saying that at all. But it is there in the New Testament. And it is there in our history if we will we'll look at it. But for some reason, I don't know. Today, you say that and people go running and screaming. They think you're about ready to, instead of your 95 thesis, you're going to nail a picture of Martin Luther to the, to the back of the pulpit area. Because we're going, we're going reform, man. No, it, it's in the Bible. Yes, that's right. And so oftentimes I'm afraid that burnout and dropout and failures in the ministry have been the result of one man simply trying to carry too much. All right, we'll leave you there. I do have a